morning to worship with us. Amen? Thank you, Lord. we give you glory God thank you for this time Lord you are great and great to be praised amen yes. we welcome you with praise and we sing great are you Lord you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope 
you restore every heart that is broken who great are you lord is it your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs oh so we pour out our praise to you only. Yeah. Sing, you give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken yeah lord we sing great are you lord because yeah. it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, oh. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, oh. So we pour out our praise to you only. Yeah. Oh, we Lift it up, all the earth, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing and cray. And are you, Lord? Yes. Oh, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will say, Great, oh, are you, Lord, all the earth is. Oh, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will say, praised are you Lord we worship you we sing great oh great are you Lord all oh, you worthy Jesus is we sing great are you Lord as you are great oh Great are you, Lord. With all we have, we worship you, yeah. Oh, great are you, Lord. With a mighty sound, you are great. 
Let's shout out. And it's your prayer in our long days. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your prayer in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Yes, Holy Spirit, we worship you tonight. There's nothing
think as we were worshiping that there were 120 gathered that day when the church began there were one mind and one accord and the Holy Spirit fell and I feel that same presence of what I what I think it felt like that day do you know how many people were registered for this event tonight 120 Amen. there's significance in numbers And I believe in the last 12 months, as we've seen Pastor Andy Veely go home and be with the Lord and, and Sister Elizabeth Robbins go home and be with the Lord just in the last couple of months, I believe that they're sitting on the edge of heaven tonight and they're joining with us in worship to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that is dwelling here with us tonight. We know that you desire to do a work, and all you want is a yielded heart, saying, Welcome, Holy Spirit. You are welcome in this place. Do you agree with that tonight? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. Amen. I would ask William and William Ligon and John Ligon, if you would come up. Good evening, everyone. It's so good to be here with you. And we have the privilege of introducing uh, someone that's dear to our heart today. But I'd like to make one little personal thing. I'd like to introduce my fiance, Wendy Hall, if she would stand up. <laughs> and, well, you, you can, wait. yeah, you just stand. <laughs> anyway, but uh, I wanted to, I wanted to say that I know a lot of people have been praying and believing for a miracle that, that a girl would even go out with me. And so, anyway, the Lord has blessed me with a very beautiful girl that loves the Lord, loves me. But um, tonight we want to introduce someone that's dear to our hearts, that, um, you know, ha is dear to so many of you here, that y'all have known him through the years, and you've seen what the Lord has done through the fellowship of churches, and how the Lord's ministered to us and through us and how he's visited us with a with some special moments of where the Holy Spirit's just just graced us with amazing things that we've had the privilege of being a part of and I think about the reason that he comes to us he comes that we're the temple and so I think about Bill Ligon and I think of what's it like when God comes to his temple and I think that he lays out a welcome mat. I believe he serves him like Abraham served him. That he'd run and go get a little fatted calf. And, and he'd try to prepare a meal for the Lord. I've seen him grow and develop over the years to where he was very ambitious in a good way. To, to have a, a good church and to build a work that would bless the Lord, but it was ambition. But, you know, we all develop and we all grow. And I have to say, I've seen Bill Ligon grow in so many ways. And it's come into submission and sweetness. So many people were scared of Dad. They thought he could see right through them. <laughs> and he could tell them every sin that they were committing. They can't. They can't. And, but, but he's gotten so sweet now. And he preaches... <laughs> He preaches to everything. I mean, I see him witness all the time. And he'll, he'll say, I, I want to ask you one of the most important questions anyone could ever ask you. Do you have Jesus in your heart? And we, I get to watch him witness to so many people doing that. And he does it all the time. He even preaches to the little dogs, our little doggy at home. He teaches her the Ten Commandments and everything. So he's preaching to all the creatures. But we're just so proud of him. 
I know y'all are proud of him. And I tell you, his sermons are getting better and better. You ought to listen to the podcasts and everything. So, praise the Lord. I'm so proud that he's going to be speaking to us tonight. Thank you, John. Well, it, uh, I tell you, it's a treat to be able to say something about someone that you um, honor and respect and love so dearly. And I, I was looking at... Um, the, the theme for the conference, honoring the past, forging the future. And you know, if you think about it, our today, our future, rests on the foundations that were laid in the past. And that foundation begins first with the power of God that was demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus. And then he calls men to him, and those that respond have the privilege of that, having that spirit that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead come into their body. And then God begins to work through them and operate through them. And in a sense, they become an extension of the hand of God working in the lives of people. And we get to see that as a demonstration of the character of na and nature of Christ in that person. Now, I can tell you that John and I have tested that truth, you know, plenty of times. <laughs> and we have seen the nature of Christ in him. And you see, you and I, we have something in common today, tonight. And that is that Bill Ligon, at some point in our past, he has helped lay a foundation for us that has influenced our lives. And because of that, and because we have seen his example, we have a bright future. He's shown us Christ and how to live and how to honor him uh, with our lives. And so, Dad, we want to hear what you have to say, and we're glad that you're here to share this time with you. I said, you want to bring a greeting and, you know, because he's our senator for the third district and he said, not right now. <laughs> he didn't tell me that they were coming up here. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. But I'm so thrilled to have part of my family here. Uh, my dear wife, Dorothy Jean. Stand up, baby. <laughs> her church nearly 61 years ago, 60 and a half, and to preach, and she came out with the choir and started playing the organ, and I forgot my sermon. <laughs> and she's been distracting me ever since now, <laughs> these 60 years, you know. But it's been a great journey, and then the Lord's given us two fine sons that you've just met here, and uh, William has five, has a precious Christian wife and five children. And uh, John has met this precious, beautiful girl, little Wendy, who loves Jesus with all her heart and uh, is on the medical staff at, uh, at Memorial Hospital in Savannah. And uh, we're just thrilled that she's coming into our family next week. That's right. She'll be our daughter in love, not our daughter in law, right? <laughs> Amen. I want to share a few thoughts with you about something that I have seen either be the foundation of success or failure for people in ministry. And it's simply this. Ministers become what they behold. You become what you behold. Henry Drummond said that everything has to be born and lifted from above. He said, the mineral kingdom is lifted by the vegetable kingdom. The vegetable kingdom is lifted by the animal kingdom. The animal kingdom is lifted by the human kingdom. 
But he said the human kingdom can only be lifted by the divine kingdom. And how true, how awesome that is. What you set before yourself changes you into its likeness. And Satan is busy trying to set before us things that will pull us down and destroy the ministry that God has for us. James said it this way in James chapter 1 and verse 15. He said, then when lust hath conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Now we know that lust is not just lust of the flesh. There's lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, lust of the pride of life. There are a lot of things after which people lust in their lives. And uh, they become great distractions in their life. Some of you know the testimony that I've given in the past that when I came out of the military and went to college to prepare myself for ministry, I went to a, a church not too far from the college and told the pastor, I'm here to prepare, train to be a minister, and I need to get started. So I'll cut your grass, I'll clean your building, but I need something to do. I have to start somewhere if I'm going to prepare myself for ministry. I said, you don't know me? I'd be glad to give you some references. He said, uh, I have a 15-year-old class of boys, Sunday school class, and every teacher who I put in there has quit. <laughs> he said, would you take them? I said, Pastor, I'm your servant. I'll do whatever you want me to do. As I said, I would cut your grass in your building. He said, no, I want you to take this class of rebellious boys. I said, how many do you have? He said, there are only about four left. I said, okay, I'm your servant. If that's what you want me to do, I'll do that. I said, but sir, I said, uh, I need the name and the phone number and the address of every boy in your community who is uh, eligible to be in that class. He gave them to me, and when I would get out of class, I would go in the community after the boys were out of school and find them, play ball with them, talk with them, and pretty soon the little class began to grow. Five, 15, 20. And those little boys started getting saved. Take them to the pastor, and he'd baptize them. Nine months later, a church over in another community asked the pastor, do you know where we could find a student to be our pastor? He said, he's in our church. And I found myself pastoring a neighboring church. It was a wonderful opportunity. Pretty soon students from the college were coming to our meetings in our church. But I took my eyes off Jesus, put my eyes on success. Maybe you've never done that. But I did. And then when I was graduating from college, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, came by. He said, Bill, we've been watching you. He said, there's a nice church over here in southern Mississippi. It needs a pastor. And he said, uh, you can go to the seminary in New Orleans. I said, you want to seminary? I said, yes, sir, I'm going to seminary, graduate school. He said, you can go there. He said, I want you to come down, and I'm going to have you preach for me, and I'll have a committee there from that church, and they'll call you. Based on your record, they'll call you. But I took my eyes off the cross. I'd taken my eyes off of Jesus. I was riding on success. So I didn't pray. I didn't seek God. I graduated. Resigned my church, told them goodbye, and got in my car and drove to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. The pastor put me in his pulpit before about 3,000 people. And it's like God said, okay, since you're on your own now, let's see how you can handle it without me. <clears throat> and I stumbled all over myself. I couldn't get my thoughts together. Nothing seemed to work. 
the anointing wasn't there. When it was through, the pastor walked up to me on the platform. He said, you've embarrassed me today. That's the worst sermon I've ever heard. I had a committee here to listen to you. And now I have to go explain to them what they heard today. No one will ever want you to be their pastor. And he turned around and walked off. I stood there, stunned at what I'd heard. I was supposed to have lunch with the pastor and with that committee from that other church. I saw a side door. I walked out the side door, got in my car, and drove away. And for the next six months, God began to help me understand what I'd done wrong. I had taken my eyes off of Jesus and I had become what I was beholding. I had become that. At the end of that one semester in seminary, I got in my car and drove to Florida where my parents, Tallahassee, where they were retired. <clears throat> and I stayed in their guest bedroom for a week, weeping, praying, talking to God. <clears throat> After about two days, my dad walked in. He had been an educator, and he didn't understand laziness, he said. said. Son, have you gotten lazy? What's happened to you? Why are you lying around here? Are you going back to seminary? No, sir, not right now. Well, you can't lie around here. You better go get your job. Yes, sir. I continued to pray. Wednesday, from all through the weekend, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, staying in that room. Wednesday afternoon, my father walked in. He said, uh, the school superintendent here in the county is a friend of mine. He said, I talked to him, and he said he'd put you to work. So you need to go tomorrow to see him. And he walked out of the room. I stayed there. Thursday, I was still there praying. I said, Lord, I don't want to be a teacher. I, I, you call me to be a pastor, Lord. What's happened? Where is it? And then it would come back to me. You took your eyes off me. You put your eyes on your own program, your own success. My father came in Thursday afternoon. Did you go see the superintendent? No, sir. What? You can't stay here, son. What are, you, what are you going to do? Dad, I don't know. I don't know, Dad. I, I couldn't even tell my father what I'd done wrong and how I had failed. He didn't know. Friday morning, my mother, my, my mother called me, came to the room and said, Son, Dr. Harold Sanders is on the phone. He wants to talk to you. He heard you're in town. Dr. Sanders was pastor of the First Baptist Church at Tallahassee, Florida. I went to the phone. He said, Bill, would you come down to my office? And I said, yes, sir. I went down. I thought the Lord was going to chastise me some more. I sat down in his office, and he said, I need an assistant pastor. I want to put your name up tomorrow night before the deacons. I said, no, sir, you don't want me. Why not? And I told him the story. The first person I told and he sat there for a moment, meditated on what I'd told him. He said, have you learned your lesson? I said, I have learned it big. I have learned it. I'm serious. I said, I've never learned anything as well as I've learned this, doctor. He said, well, I still want you. I said, well, I said, the last time I talked to a pastor of a big church like this, I didn't talk to God. I said, if you don't mind, let me go home and spend some time with the Lord. So I went home and got in that room again. Friday afternoon, my dad came in. Son, have you gone yet to see the superintendent? I said, no, sir, but I told him what happened. He said, Dr. Harold Sanders offered you a job? I said, yes, sir. You're going to take it, aren't you? I said, I don't, I don't know, Daddy. 
You don't know? No. Why not? I just need to talk to God for a while. So I talked to him Friday and Saturday. Went to hear Dr. Sanders Sunday morning. Came back. Talked to him all the way through to Monday morning. He said I could call him on Monday. On Monday morning, the, past, the doctor, excuse me, the, the Lord said, I'm sorry, this is so, so tender in my heart, I've never forgotten it all these years. He said, okay, you can tell him yes. But don't ever forget who you're supposed to keep your eyes on. And I want to say to you, never forget who you're supposed to keep your eyes on. If you want God to use you, keep your eyes on Jesus and no one else. Jesus is the way. In John 1.14, the word says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. That word beheld in the Greek means to look closely at with an earnest and intense desire to inspect and to know intimately. To contemplate the glory of God. To look at the Lord and to meditate upon his presence. To know him. There was a man in the Old Testament who took his eyes off the Lord He'd been a very diligent young man, a tremendous shepherd. God chose him over all of his older brothers who were much more capable than he. His name was David. God raised him up to be a king. And after David became a king, he walked out on his balcony one day, and looked down and saw one of his army captain's wife taking a shower in the courtyard, a beautiful girl. And at that moment, he took his eyes off Jesus and set his eyes on a woman. Ended up committing adultery with her and having her husband murdered to cover up his sin. Later on, after he had learned his lesson, David said this, behold, the fullness of the Lord. Behold, the fullness of the Lord. You become what you behold. He went on to say, turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in thy ways. He said in Psalm 101, 3, I will set no worthless, wicked thing before my eyes. He had learned his lesson. In Psalm 101, verse 4, he said, A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. There was another man who was being trained by the Lord himself for ministry. His name was Peter. And in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus began to talk to his disciples about his forthcoming crucifixion. And Peter pulled him aside and rebuked him. Can you imagine? Why in the world would Peter rebuke the master? Because he had taken his eyes off Jesus and the divine purpose for which he was there And he put his eyes on success and overcoming by his own strength. He said to Jesus, this is never going to happen to you. We're we're going to take care of that, Jesus. No one's going to harm you. We're going to be your protector. But Jesus said in verse 23, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. How in the world had Peter become Satan? By beholding the wrong thing. 
by taking his eyes off of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and putting his eyes on what he himself wanted instead of what God desired and planned. Now here's the dilemma that we're facing today. Our people are beholding the wrong thing. The average church member spends two hours a week in church and the rest of the time beholding all kinds of media and activity that determines what they become. Many things distract us, but we become what we behold. Whatever we set our affection upon, that we will become. One day, the secretary said, there's a pastor on the phone who wants to speak to you. When I got on the phone, he identified himself. He said, I'm a Methodist pastor in Atlanta. I heard you speak at a conference, and I feel like you would keep confidence I need to come and talk to you. I said, certainly. So I gave him an appointment and he drove from Atlanta to Brunswick, sat in my office and poured his heart out. He had allowed sin to come into his life. And he said, I don't know how to get out of it. This sin that has taken over my life. I said, well, you know how it happened, don't you? He said, what do you mean? I said, you became what you beheld. You began to look at things on the internet, on your computer, and you have become what you behold. I said, now, Jesus said, men will not live on bread alone, but by on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I said, what word are you living on? What do you mean, he said. I said, well, Jesus said you're to live on every word. He said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. What words are you living on? What words are you contemplating? What are you setting your affection on before the Lord? He said, I, I, I really don't know. I said, well, let me, let me begin with you. I said, uh, Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And the law gives the character traits of God that he wants in the lives of his servants. I said, quote the Ten Commandments. He couldn't do it. I said, well, don't, don't feel too bad. I said, just a few years ago, I was complaining to God that judges were removing the Ten Commandments from public buildings and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you're a hypocrite. I said, hey, I'm a hypocrite, Lord. He said, quote the Ten Commandments. I stumbled over about three or four of them. And then the thought came, until you meditate on my word like I've told you to, morning, noon, and night, don't complain to me about the judges. He said, you have the keys to your church where you have them posted. I said, we don't, Lord. You have the keys to your academy. Where do you have them posted? We don't, Lord. Then why are you complaining to me about them not being on the walls of public schools when they're not on the walls of your private school? I said, Lord, I am a hypocrite. I've become what I have beheld. My critical nature against the public and the way they're behaving, removing the Ten Commandments, has become my own judge. I'm judged by what I've accused others of doing. Shortly after that, I heard about a pastor up in Chattanooga, Tennessee. You know him, Charlie Wasson. Charlie couldn't be here this time. But Charlie had a had a heart to get the Ten Commandments in every home of America. And he would give a pastor a beautiful framed copy of the Ten Commandments if he would promote it in his church. 
I ordered my copy. We posted it in the house, and I began to meditate. So God had changed me. I said to this Methodist pastor, God has dealt with me. I said, I'm going to give you an assignment. I gave him other scriptures also. I want you to go home and I want you to take your eyes off that computer and put your eyes on the Lord, on the cross of Jesus Christ, and on the Word of God. Meditating morning, noon, and night on His Word. Now here's an appointment time. Come back in six weeks and we'll start our counseling. Six weeks later, he returned. I said, how did you do? He said, I struggled for two weeks. Every day I would start trying to meditate on scripture, but the, the thought would come and I'd be pulled back toward that computer and I'd turn it on and I'd begin to sin. He said, after about two weeks, when they had, had my computer there, and when the thought came, turn it on and look. I said, the second commandment says, that I shall have no idols, no graven images, and that's idolatry. He said, the seventh commandment says, that I shall not commit adultery, and that's adultery. And for about a week, I did that every time the thought came to sin. And pretty soon, the temptation began to subside and cease. He said, I've been about a month now free from sin. I said, uh, well, now we can start counseling. He said, I don't need it. He said, I just came to thank you. I said, you mean the Word of God does a better job than pastoral counseling? He said, it sure does. I said, I agree with you, 100%. The Holy Scriptures will do it. It will do it. It changes our lives. We have to ask ourselves, what are we focusing our attention on? What are we meditating on? Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9 says this, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence or if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace shall be with you. What have you set before you? I commend to you today the cross of Jesus Christ. I want to give you a way to victory in closing. I gave this to our people Sunday morning. I'm closing my message today. And it will lead each one of us to victory, I believe. First of all, you must see the cross in your life. Conform yourself to the image of Christ. It will do that. Secondly, you must take up your cross. In Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, Jesus said those who find their lives, those who lose their lives for my sake will find them. But those who find them and their own will lose them. Thirdly, embrace the cross. In difficult trials, do not lose the opportunity to embrace the cross. Your strength, your power to overcome. Number four, learn to suffer in humility and peace. Don't be afraid of rejection. They rejected the Lord. They will reject you. One of my dear friends who had been an excellent pastor for years, I had used him many times to preach in my pulpit, came under criticism and attack in his church. Instead of him taking up his cross and focusing on the cross, 
he folked, focused on the rejection and the criticism. The more he focused on it, the more depressed he became. He had a, a, a subjected resentment and anger inside and he wasn't bringing it out very strongly, but he would just say, but you don't know what they're doing to me. One day he called me and he said, Bill, he said, I'm sick, I need you. He was still in his church. I said, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. He said, wait till after dark, I don't need people seeing you come in my house. I said, I'll wait till after dark. He said, if you don't mind, come in the back door. I said, I know how to get in your back door. I'll come in the back door. He had a carport. I went to his house, pulled up in the driveway on the side, walked through the carport, opened the back door without knocking into his den. It went into his den. He was sitting in his recliner. A man with a college degree, two earned seminary degrees, one of the best Bible teachers and preachers I'd ever seen, but he was in total depression over rejection, over rejection in his church, all because of one reason. He took his eyes off the cross, off of Jesus, and put his eyes on the rejection, on the offenses that people were bringing against him. I sat there with him for two hours, trying to point him to the cross and to Jesus. No matter what I said, he would say, but you don't know what they're saying about me. You don't know what they're doing. And I would say, but they said things like that about Jesus. Turn your eyes on Jesus. But you don't know what they're saying. You don't know what they're doing. Only after about two hours, I said, well, I'm going home and call me if you want me back. Instead, the next week, they voted him out of the church. He left and moved to another city, never pastored again. Got a job in a men's clothing store. Two years later, his wife called me. I said, Bill, my husband just died. I said, what? What happened? She said, the doctors did physicals. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. I think he died of a broken heart. Would you do his funeral? And we'll take him back to our hometown. I said, I will. Just tell me how to get there. I went to the hometown, to a little country church, did his funeral. The cemetery was out by the church. We went out to the cemetery, and I concluded the service there. And the friends were comforting the wife and children. And I stood there looking at my friend's casket. And I said, Lord, I don't understand. He was a better preacher than I. He was better educated than I. Why is he there? And I'm here, Lord. And this thought came to me. Because he did it his way. And you're doing it my way. I said, Lord, you taught me a long time ago not to do it my way anymore. I don't like my way, Lord. I like your way. Your way is better. About 10 years later, his son called me and said, Pastor Bill, Mama just died. Would you do her funeral? I said, I'll be right there. I went back to the same little church in the same town, did her funeral, went out to the cemetery, finished the service, and the friends were comforting the children and grandchildren then. I stood there reading the tombstone, the engraving on the tombstone of my friend. I said, Lord, I know he's having a great time with you. But here I am. And Lord, I just want to stay true to you until you call me home. I just want to stay true to you until you call me home. The Lord wants you to stay true to him until he calls you home. A man sat in my office yesterday. He said, I'm diagnosed with stage four cancer. I'd never met the man before. One of our members brought him to me. He said, it's spreading all throughout my body. I've lost one of my lungs. 
I said, do you know Jesus? He said, well, I do, kind of. But anyway, so pretty soon he had made a declaration of his faith in Christ fully to the Lord. And I said, now look, I said, I could, I could die and go to heaven before you do. I said, you have a choice. You can either focus on your sickness and your affliction, or if you have a month, if you have a year, whatever you have, you can spend your time telling other people what Jesus has done for you today. Now here's you some literature. You can take it and use it and be used of God. Focus on the Lord. Take your eyes off your disease and focus on the Lord and begin to tell others about Jesus. And if, if he gives you more time, praise the Lord. But your focus is on the wrong thing. You're focused on this disease. And take your eyes off the disease and begin to tell people about what Jesus just did for you in your heart. Number five, abandon all self-love. Your deep self-centeredness and self-love makes the cross too heavy to bear. Number six, do not reject the full work that the power of the cross will do in you. Number seven, allow the Holy Spirit the Lord to bring the cross into the very center of all that you are and all that you're doing. Number eight, know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Number nine, know that God is your father. He loves you. Number 10, your oversensitivity makes your trials worse. Abandon yourself right now and turn yourself over. To God. Abandon yourself right now and turn yourself over to God. Pastor Mark Linton and some others are going to give you a copy of those 10 right now. They're going to begin to go around and hand them out. I encourage you to take it with you and meditate on the cross. How awesome it is to be a servant of the Lord. I want to close with this as you receive your copy. About four or five years ago, my primary physician sent me to Emory for a physical. The doctor did the physical and he said, you're, pretty in, you're in pretty good shape for your age. I said, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. But I said, doctor, I know exactly how long I'm going to live. He said, no one knows that. I said, I do. How could you know how long you're going to live? I said, well, the Lord straightened me out a long time ago and I'm here on divine assignment. Each day, I'm committed to do what the Lord directs me to do. So I'm on a mission. And when my mission is over, I'm out of here. I said, Jesus said, my time is not yet. So obviously, you're saying my time is not yet. You say I'm in pretty good shape. I said, but I want you to know that every day is God's day whatever God wants. But what about you, doctor? What's going to happen to you when you die? He said, well, I'm a Methodist. <laughs> I said, that's wonderful. I said, Methodists are real nice people. I said, I like Methodists, but I don't find anything in the Bible that says, if you're a Methodist, you'll go to heaven. Or if you're a Baptist, you'll go to heaven. I said, doctor, Jesus said, you must be born again. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I said, you must be born again. Can you right now declare, doctor, Jesus Christ is my Lord? He said, yes, I will. And he did. He declared, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Lord, I thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving my sins. I commit myself to you, Jesus. I commit myself to you. I said, now, doctor, you're on divine assignment, helping other people get well. And when your time is up, you're going to heaven. So now you and I both know exactly how long we're going to live. You're going to live until the Lord's through with you. What about you? Do you know how long you're going to live? I pray that you do. 
that tonight you have it settled in your heart. I'm on divine assignment. I'm here with purpose. My life belongs to the Lord. He determines my day, each day, morning, noon, and night. I belong to him. Therefore, I'm surrendered to him. Absolute surrender. Can you say that tonight? If you can, with me, follow through and say, I take up my cross and follow Christ. I no longer want to be self-centered, anxious about life, fearful about what's going to happen, preoccupied with the things around me and what people say and what people do, what they say about me on Facebook, wherever it is. Oh, my goodness. Right now, I'm focused on Jesus. He's my Lord and my Savior. If you can say that tonight as a consecration of yourself to the Lord, would you stand up with me right now and open your hands up to the Lord? I'm going to ask the musicians to come back up here, and we'll just begin to worship the Lord for a minute and honor his precious holy name. Oh, Jesus, say with me. Say, Lord Jesus, Jesus, here is my life. life. It belongs to you. you. My life and my times times are in your hands. hands. You direct my steps. steps. And when my mission is over over. in this world, world, I look forward forward. to meeting you in heaven heaven. and spending spending eternity with you in the joy of your presence. In Jesus' name. Now let's just begin to worship him and praise him. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Comfort this place and fill the air. taking leadership here in the FCMI. It's, it's wonderful. We began about 43 years ago, Brother Ed and I back there. And, uh, you know, I told uh, in a meeting earlier today, the Presbytery, I said, uh, we old codgers are just so thrilled to see you guys step up and take over. And we're just ha- so happy. You're doing a great job, all of you. All of this new leadership. We just praise God for you. Amen. <laughs> I'll ask all the presbyters if you would come and join me here on the platform. Would all of these men share in the load and, and the discussions and the decision making of FCMI? And it is an honor, truly an honor, to work with each one of these. And and, uh, 
and to have served under Pastor Ligon the years I was at Brunswick Church. And Pastor Ligon is still my pastor. And I believe every pastor needs a pastor. And Pastor Ligon is my pastor. And, and uh, it's an honor uh, to, to continue to work with you. Thank you. And uh, uh, we've been pastoring here for January will be eight years. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been awesome. But I, but I would not want to do this without a pastor in my life. So I honor Pastor Ligon for being my pastor. Amen. Come on, Brother Ed. I'd just like for you to see who all is, is part of FCMI and, and the leadership and, and making decisions and working together. And it's an honor to, to be here to do that. And um, it, it, it's something when God puts uh, people like us together of all ages and... and uh, it's such an honor to, to listen to the wisdom and to, to glean from these men who have been through so much in ministry. It helps us younger guys to where we can see things a little better and see things at a different angle and perspective. And, and I thank God for these men and thank God for the FCMI leadership tonight. Amen. Give them a hand. We'll be here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. There'll be two sessions tomorrow morning. Uh, pastor Gilbert Posey and Zach McClendon, the uh, worship pastor in Statesboro, Pastor David McClendon's son. So it's going to be a treat. We'll have a, have a Zach McClendon young and, and uh, Gilbert Posey not quite as young. Where's he at anyway? There he is. Okay. And uh, then tomorrow night, Pastor David McClendon. And then Friday we'll have a, have a schedule full as well. We'll share more about that uh, tomorrow. But be here with us tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And I believe it's going to be an incredible time together. Thank you all for being here. Pastor Gilbert, would you close us out tonight, brother? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the word that you brought through Pastor Ligon to us all tonight. Lord, uh, help us to, to truly behold you in all your glory the rest of this evening. And, and Lord, the, the rest of our ministry the rest of our lives Lord God that we would truly as David behold your glory God let us be transformed Lord God into the image of him Lord God that we behold let us be changed by his power Lord uh, bless the FCMI bless each one gathered here tonight give everyone safe journey everyone peaceful restful sleep God we thank you that uh, Lord you're preparing us for such a time as this and Lord as you work in in your way Lord in, in that, Lord, we'd be a people who know your ways. And, Lord, as you work your way in us, Lord, let us bring glory to your kingdom. For it's in Jesus' strong and mighty name we ask and pray. Amen.